everybody and welcome. Great to see so many of you here. Um, my name is Joanne Reeve, I'm chair of SAPC and I'm delighted to be, um, to be hosting this evening's um, lecture. Um, as many of you know, this, um, this lecture is in memory of Helen Lester. Um, Professor Helen Lester was an inspirational GP and academic who made a, a real difference to the lives of many people. Helen was truly one of the iconic figures of, of our discipline, of academic general practice. Helen died peacefully at home with her family in March 2013, a date which feels both like yesterday and a lifetime ago um, to us all. Helen was secretary to SAPC from 2004 to 2010 and then chair from 2010 to 2013. And Helen did many things, but, but the thing that, that inspired us for, for this evening is Helen challenged us to think more creatively about many things, but especially about mental health. Only weeks before she died, Helen gave the eponymous James Mackenzie lecture at the Royal College of GPs, a lecture in memory of another of the great names in our discipline, who made such a difference in primary care. In her Bothering About Billy lecture, Helen challenged us all to think differently about the needs and care of people with complex and long-standing mental health problems. But even more, she challenged us to do things differently. So inspired by Helen, one of the things that we started was this series of annual public lectures, an opportunity to showcase work that resonates with Helen's values of making a difference. When we were putting together the programme for this year, we, are, we invited Professor Aidan Halligan to give the lecture this, this evening. Some of you will know that very sadly, Aidan died suddenly um, not long ago. And we were very sad that we weren't able to, to hear of the news and that he wasn't able to join us, obviously. We did speak with his, his colleagues about whether it, it was appropriate to go ahead and they wanted us to go ahead with the lecture. We also note that um, it's 10 years on from, from when we were all in Gateshead at the time of the 7-7 disaster. So it feels like a, 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 an evening where there's an awful lot to, to think about and reflect on. And I'd like us all just to maybe just take a minute, just to, a minute of silence, just to, to have a, our own thoughts. Thank you. We were absolutely delighted um, when, when we invited Professor Carolyn Chu Graham to come and give us a lecture this evening, that she agreed to, to come and speak with us, to tell us the work that she, to, to tell us and, and you about the work she's led over the years to make a difference for people with mental health problems. We, Hugh Lester, Helen's husband, unfortunately wasn't able to join us this evening. We did have a conversation with him fairly recently and he sends everyone his warmest regards and, and sent very fond memories of his time with us last year at, at the first Helen lecture. I've just been asked to just um, let you know or remind you, if, if you um, are already aware, about the, the college's Helen Lester Fellowship Scheme. Um, this has been a, a fellowship fund set up in memory of Helen to fund um, work into mental health. There's more details available on the Royal College of GPs website and also you can come and speak with me or with Imran Rafi who's in the room as well um, later. And the closing date for applications is the end of July. So if you have somebody in your department or you yourself would be interested in applying then please do have a look at that. So, Professor Carolyn Chu Graham embodies the SAPC vision of excellence in academic professional practice, driving improvements in the delivery of person-centred primary care. Her impressive CV lists a, not a, li a range of notable achievements and roles, including her work as a GP principal in Manchester. 
She's Professor of General Practice Research at Keele, Honorary Professor of Primary Care Mental Health at South Staffs and Shropshire Foundation Trust, sorry. The RCGP Curriculum Advisor for Mental Health and member of the, of the NICE Clinical Guidelines Group on, on Depression and Multimorbidity. She was a leading member of the AMP team, which offered us new ways to think about how we provide mental health care for underserved communities who were often seen as hard to reach. This being part of a wider body of work on managing distress. But you're going to hear much more about that from Carolyn herself. And in between all of that, she, she's a wife and a mum, and you might hear a bit about that too. So can I invite you in, to join me in welcoming Professor Carolyn Chu Graham to the stage? Well, thank you very much, Joe. You've said most of the things I was going to say, so we could just all go home now. But um, OK, we're here for half an hour or so. Um, and let me use the... Oh, gosh, I think I need somebody technical to take this thing off again. Anyway... If I just go like that. No, use the mouse to click on the Sorry, I, um, I either fall off the stage or do something with the technology. So I have a history. There we go. So I don't want to repeat what Joe said, but we are here this evening to remember the work that Helen did around improving quality in primary care, about health inequalities, and around primary care mental health. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about what Helen meant to all of us. I'm going to recall Helen's contributions to patient care and to the mental health agenda. I'm going to talk a bit about how I came to give this talk. Joanne's already said a little about that. And I'm going to talk a little bit about me particularly with a focus around making a difference, which is what Helen wanted to do, about making an impact, about changing patients' lives, but also about bridging between worlds. I think we all occupy a number of different worlds, and I want to try and draw some of these out. But as I say, Joe's already mentioned them, a lot of them. So I first met Helen in 2006 at SAPSI at Kiel. It was a beautiful summer's day. We sat on the grass. And Helen had contacted me to say she wanted to talk to me about coming to Manchester and what Manchester was like. Would I ditch the dirt? So we sat on the grass in the sunshine, and I think we must have talked about her work. Um, we certainly, she, she certainly mentioned that she could write very well, and I, having had a look at her work after our conversation, I realised that she could. What struck me was her humility and her passion, her passion about her work. But also what I remember was that she has a, had a love of shoes. And when I spoke to Sue Stewart in, in preparing this presentation, the first thing Sue said was, gosh, remember those shoes, those red high-heeled shoes at Gateshead? Weren't they fab? I miss those. So Helen was duly appointed to a chair in primary care research at the University of Manchester and worked with Martin Rowland, who I can't see in the audience, but I hope he's here. You've taken your jacket off. And in preparing this talk, I spoke to lots of people who knew Debbie and who could give me some insight and help me, help me prepare the presentation, really, do it for me. But what Martin said was, and I think this encapsulates Helen, she didn't go into things half-heartedly. And as she became ill, she also became more and more determined to leave her mark on the world, which she did. One of the other things that she did when she was in Manchester was set up Primer. This was the PPI group, which is still going strong seven years later, and is now run by Claire Planner, along with some PPI group members. And speaking to Claire about Primer, what struck Claire was her enthusiasm, her passion, her feeling that patients should be involved right at the start of research in generating ideas, in contributing to research proposals, in looking at um, documents, public facing documents, and in helping in dissemination. Because only by involving patients and the public could you actually do the research that, that people wanted and that was going to make a difference. Claire very kindly asked around the group members in Primer to say, what did they think about Helen? And Susie said, a lady with a beaming smile came up to me and asked if I wanted a cup of tea. 
This was Susie's first meeting at Primer. I didn't know who this person was, but she could tell I was nervous and she took the time to make me feel calmer. As the meeting started, she introduced herself as Helen Lester. Her passion for PPI was infectious and she had this incredible gift of treating everyone the same. I'm heavily involved in PPI now and I owe this to Helen. I think she saw something in me that I could play a part in passing the baton regarding PPI. Thank you, Helen. I'll never forget you. And Helen, while she was in Manchester, took up a number of roles at the RCGP. I'm not going to go through them. What I would like to say is that Helen was um, instrumental in helping us form the Primary Care Mental Health Forum, which was a collaboration between the RC Psych and the RCGP. And I'd also got to wave this at you, which Joe's already done, which is the Helen Lester Appeal for Mental Health Research. And as Joe said, the deadline is not to the end of July, so if you've got a good idea that's going to make a real difference to mental health research in primary care, put an application in. And I want to mention a book that Helen edited with Linda, ba Linda Gask and Tony Kendrick and Rob Pevelet. This is a fantastic book, which you all should have read. It was one of the BMA Book Award uh, winners in 2010. And I've put Anne Rogers in the centre of that slide because she and Dave Pilgrim wrote a fantastic chapter which really took, takes a critical sociological perspective, don't let that put you off, about the role of primary care in managing people with mental health problems and how it's become a central part of medical care today. And I think that whole book epitomises what Helen tried to do, which was to raise the profile of mental health care. And I feel very privileged that I'm working with Linda and Tony on the second edition of this book. And we all know that Helen was a GP. She was very proud to be a GP. Having joined her practice in 1991, she set up undergraduate and postgraduate teaching. She developed practice-based service for people with mental health problems, and that's where her research grew from. And Helen was really well regarded by her patients. And I won't read this quote out, I'll let you read it yourselves. And as we've heard, <coughs> Helen was a researcher. And Joe's already mentioned the James McKenzie lecture in 2012. And again, if you've not looked at this, do. Helen was very ill at the time, but she still gave a fantastic lecture, telling us GPs that actually we've got to do better with people with severe and enduring mental health problems. <coughs> we've got to not just screen, we've got to intervene. Because scandalously, people with severe and enduring mental health problems die 20 years younger than their counterparts, and it's not through complications of their severe and enduring health problem, it's not through suicide, it's through cardiovascular and metabolic problems. So Helen worked tirelessly to improve the lot and make care of people, of the physical health of people with severe and enduring mental health problems, part of the core business of primary care. And working with her about being bothered about Billy was David Shires, who's a retired GP from Leek. Um, I was going to make a, a, jo a joke about he's on the right, but actually, is he on your right as well? Yeah. Um, David has worked with people in Australia um, to really look and develop the work that we should be doing in primary care to improve the lot of people who've got schizophrenia and bipolar. And Helen and David <coughs> produced the fact sheet for the Primary Care Mental Health Forum, um, which you know, is on the RCGP website, have a look at it. But more importantly, they produced HEAL. And this is something that should be in all GP practices. It tells us how to do it. And the Leicester cardio, Positive Cardiometabolic Health Resource, again, is something that should be in all GP practice surgeries, telling us not to just screen, but we need to intervene. And Helen was a mentor to a number of people. Liz England says she was a total superwoman, managed to combine meaningful time with family, academic career, being a workaholic, being a GP, hard to live up to, a great mentor. And so a year ago, we were sitting in Edinburgh, it was sunny last year as well, 
2014, Debbie, gave, Debbie Sharp gave a fantastic inaugural lecture on motherhood and mental illness, 30 years of families in South London. And so I'm supposed to follow Debbie. So we're here in Oxford and it's not sunny, the skies aren't blue. So how am I going to follow Debbie? And as you've heard, I wasn't the first choice. <laughs> Aidan should be here, um, and I didn't do half the stuff that he did. I don't know if you, you know of Aidan's Hayden, work, but he was a professor of fetal and maternal medicine in Leicestershire. He was the youngest deputy chief medical officer. He was a patient advocate all his professional life, and he directed well north in, in the north of England, looking at people to support people who were homeless and unemployed. Um, he did a lot for inequalities. He really made a difference. And I'm a poor substitute. So Helen and I worked in Manchester until she moved back to Birmingham. And I moved to Keele, thanks to Christian and Jo. Um, in, oh, oh, I'm sorry, in Rianne and Nadine and <laughs> Elaine, I must mention everybody, in 2012. And so for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk a bit about me, my work, how I strive to make a difference, strive to um, impact on patient care, and about bridging between different worlds. So, many years ago, I chose to become a GP, and this is Carl Whitehouse, who was my GP trainer. He was an immense role model. He taught me about the importance of listening to patients, finding out what they wanted. He taught me to, I hope, work with patients with humility and, and humanity. He remained a mentor to me, and now he's retired, he's, he's a good friend. He introduced me to AUDGP, and you might be thinking, those younger people in the audience will be thinking, what on earth is that? Well, that superseded AUTGP, Association of University Teachers in General Practice, which became SAPSI. Um, and in fact, looking through the history of SAPSI, I think the first conference was in 1972 at Cardiff, and... That, incidentally, was when the first professor of general practice was appointed at the University of Manchester. The first AUDGP I went to was in, I think, 92 or 93. And it was in Manchester, and it wasn't anything like conferences are today. It was organised by a bunch of us, us academics, the, the junior academics from Manchester. Um, and we had a banquet at the Yang Sing where a few people were unwell. Afterwards, not through the alcohol, I blame the prawns. Um, but we had Martin Rowland as the young, dynamic new chair in, in Manchester who, who led the way. That was a long time ago. It was, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Martin. <laughs> and actually, I remember Debbie Sharp, who isn't here today, but I've mentioned already, presenting some of her initial results from her families in South London study. And I remember then being incredibly impressed by her and watching her meteoric rise. So I became a GP. Um, my training was at the Robert Derbyshire practice in Manchester. I don't know if you know Moss Side Rush Home. It's a hard place to work. Um, people were unwell, distressed, had lots of problems. And I found it really tough. I wondered what I was doing. Why couldn't I help these people? Because they had problems that were so immense, I couldn't sort them out in a 10-minute consultation. I was fortunate enough to do a little bit of research as a GP trainee, and I think that I have always maintained my identity as a GP. That is important to me. And working closely with patients with multiple encounters over time is important to me. And I want to make a difference in those consultations. And I listened to Simon Stevens this afternoon and talk about a different way of doing it, and I think there probably is, but I don't want to lose for myself those encounters with patients. And so as a young GP, I thought, people don't come in with diagnoses, they come in with symptoms, they've got needs, they've got problems, and what am I going to do about it? 
And David Shires introduced me to Donald Sean, who said, in the varied topography of professional practice, there's a high, hard ground of technical rationality, which overlooks a swamp where problems are messy, confusing, and incapable of technical solution. <coughs> and the difficulty is that the problems of the high ground, however great their technical interest, are often unimportant to clients or patients or the larger society, while in the swamp are the problems of the greatest human concern. And I think I work as a GP in that swamp. And I think as an academic, I try and make sense of that swamp for um, other GPs, for patients, and to try and help us to the side and to get out of the swamp at times. And before I move on to my research, I introduce David Ratcliffe. It's not a great picture of him. Um, but he's, uh, he was my GP trainee many years ago, and then I joined him in a very small practice in Chalton in central Manchester. He has been a fantastic support all my clinical career. We work in a pretty grim building in central Manchester, and David has just led a merger of three practices, which has been painful at times. I have a lot of pride in David because he was my trainee, um, and... I, you know, I think I have probably done something towards the fact that he's now a clinical lead in the practice, but also medical director of the Northwest Ambulance Service. But also along the way, I became a researcher, and this is really all down to Carl May. And I don't know if you've seen on the blog that um, we did for the CMAG, Jay, I talked about Carl and, and the fact that I think one of our first encounters was a discussion about the fact that GPs couldn't write, and, and he was telling me over curry that GPs couldn't write, and I was no different, and I couldn't digest that curry because I thought I'm never going to get my thesis written. But actually, I did get my thesis written, and Carl was a fantastic su supporter, supervisor, um, mentor, friend, and thank you for coming, Carl. I'm so pleased. Um, and because of Carl, I became a researcher in qualitative methods. I think it's probably also because I'm not very good with numbers. Um, but I think being a GP, it's really important to know why, the what, the how. Why does something work? And again, I refer to St Simon Stevens' talk about the need to get you know, short, sharp, quick and dirty research into practice. But actually, there's no point knowing a treatment works unless you know why it works and how you're going to implement it. And that's what qualitative methods allow. So one of the main methods I use for collecting data is interviews. And I was reminiscing about this, and the first interviews I did as part of research was in 1990, where I drove round PCTs, general practices, talked to patients with a notepad and pen. We didn't even tape our interviews. So the, the verbatim quotes were what we'd written down. We then progressed on to cassette tapes, and for those of you who are slightly older in the audience, you'll remember the cassette tape and having to rewind it because it came out. I lost a lot of data that way. Now we digitally record. And we have really good records of the discussions that have happened. And that data is really valuable and really rich in finding out how people function, how people think, what people think they do. And Carl and I looked at the GP as a, an interviewer. We worked with Mark Perry when he was doing his M MD to look at the data that, that GPs as interviewers were acquiring. And we felt that as a GP, as any interviewer will influence the data that you collect, but as a GP, you particularly influence the data because what does that GP participant think of you? So does the GP respondent think that you're a researcher from the university? doesn't know you're a GP, do you keep it quiet? Does the GP treat you as a peer or confident? So I had a chap who said to me, oh my God, I hope you're not from the Daily Mail, because he told me some fairly private stuff. Lots of GPs talk to GP um, interviewers as, as experts, wanting answers. And they may feel that they're being judged, very careful, therefore, in the sort of information that they divulge. So further work with Carl followed, and we explored depression through qualitative studies interviewing GPs. And we found that GPs thought that depression was the new back pain, that depression was a reason for people to be off work, to be sick. It was something that allowed secondary gain. 
and that GPs felt that they might as well give a diagnosis of depression when they didn't know what else to do. And it was a way of getting rid of the patient. And this study was conducted using, using medical students to collect the data. So Hannah and Scott collected the data, contributed to the analysis, contributed to writing the paper. And I think throughout my academic career, I've tried to encourage medical students, junior doctors, to get involved in research, dip their toes in it, see what it's like. So Lindsay Wildman was a student who was interested in unexplained symptoms. And she interviewed GPs about how they cope with uh, patients where the diagnosis is unknown. And the data is really powerful and still quoted. And Lindsay certainly said that it, this made a difference to how she looked at patients. So some make your stomach churn when they come in, make you very nervous. They make it very clear that they're taking charge. And they do, they take charge. And there's nothing you can do. That's really powerful data that GPs have disclosed to a medical student. And Martin, Carl and I wrote a paper about the harmful consequences of elevating the doctor-patient relationship, something which I hold very dear, to be the primary goal of the general practice consultation. We felt from looking at data with, uh, comparative data with a, a, a number of data sets from GP interviews, we felt that patients present with intractable problems that they're difficult to challenge, that then there's collusion within the consultation. Doctors become powerless to intervene, and the problem's intractable. And we felt that actually doctors need a way of disposing of patients out of the consultation. So I was feeling a bit pessimistic by the early 2000s, and then got some funding to do a, a study of collaborative care for depression in older people. And Heather Burroughs and I did a nested qualitative study where we remained pessimistic, really. So both uh, nurses and GPs talked about the, the fact there's no point in diagnosing depression in older people. It's justified. But also patients felt there was no point talking about it. It was justified. Of course, I feel like this. And because the, justif and because the depression's justified, then there was a therapeutic nihilism. So this practice nurse says it's unfair to start delving and then say, right, fine, we found out that you're depressed, but there's nothing we can do. So you do have a tendency not to think about it too much. So this added to the literature that depression is underdiagnosed and undermanaged in primary care, particularly of older people. And so, I want to talk about two people who've played a key role in my work around depression. So Linda Gask, who I've known since I was a GP trainee, actually. I did some interviewing with her for her, her MD. And we've done a lot of work, travelled around to conferences, and feel that depression should be treated as a long-term condition. And that we need to raise the profile of depression, we need to teach GPs how to diagnose depression. And we spent a, a very nice week in Slovenia teaching Slovenian GPs how to diagnose depression in patients with diabetes. And then Chris Dowrick, who's also in the audience, I think deserves a mention, because he's been absolutely key to my development as a researcher. And I think Chris takes a slightly different approach, recognising that depression may not be a helpful label that people... As I've said, when I was a trainee, I noted that people were dis distressed and the label of depression may not necessarily help them. And without Chris and Linda, I think my research would have gone in very different directions. But moving towards the present day, I want to mention um, a paper that's become quite important to me and I think to the, the community. So Pete Coventry, who's in the audience, and I did some qualitative work in the Greater Manchester Clark, where we um, tried to identify what the barriers were to um, the detection and management of depression in people with long-term conditions. And we felt that the emotional distress was normalised by both patients and practitioners. It sounds familiar. <coughs> GPs and nurses reported that consultations were very performance-managed, time-limited. And it seemed that there was an absence of shared language and concepts about depression. So often depression wouldn't have a name for patients. 
Um, can I take this opportunity to say thank you to Peter because I was off sick when we wrote this paper and without his support and, and driving force it wouldn't have been written. And what we found was that mood wasn't prioritised. And we found that there was perhaps some evidence that clinicians might want to overcome mind-body dualism, that they might acknowledge that the physical and the mental health are linked, that you know, there's, there's a reason that we're doing this parity of esteem. But actually, the constraints that people work under mean that you can't manage the physical and mental together. And we're very proud of this paper <laughs> because we won the research paper of the year for RCGP Mental Health. Uh, and that's Helen on my right. But that was a great evening, wasn't it, Pete? <laughs> and what I've been doing for the last few years is using qualitative methods to explain <coughs> trial results. And I said Debbie isn't here, but this was a um, definitive trial to compare antidepressants with listening visits delivered by a health visitor for women with postnatal depression. <coughs> and there's a similar theme that... GPs saying, easier not to ask. If I'm never going to see this woman again, I'm not going to pick up the depression. So both health visitors and GPs were saying, we're not interested, we're not going there. And women were saying, GPs can't do very much. All they can do is dish out antidepressants, you get addicted to them, you're stuck in a vicious circle. So women were reluctant to disclose to GPs, but they were also reluctant to disclose to health visitors because of fear of being reported to social services. So quite a key paper. This is Peter Salmon, who I've worked with on a number of projects. More recently, we've worked on a, a programme grant called Choice, where we were trying to improve the care of people with long-term conditions and comorbid depression. We had a number of pieces of work in our programme, but one of them was recording consultations of routine reviews delivered by other GPs or practice nurses in routine primary care. And this patient said that she was really disappointed with her practice nurse because the patient had a lot going on. She had a divorce going on, she'd missed a couple of appointments, she had lost her inhalers or, and not arrived for a prescription and therefore had run out. And the patient was reflecting on the consultation she said, this nurse is very efficient and everything, but I didn't feel she had any empathy at all. And the comment, well, you'll remember for next time, well, that really stayed with me. And we demonstrated in this study how what happens in one consultation has an effect on what's going to happen in future consultations. And we felt that COIF has um, restricted what goes on in consultations, and patients' agendas just weren't heard. We found two exceptions to that. One was when the subject was a bereavement, and one when the subject was death. <coughs> but otherwise, it was the doctor's agenda or the nurse's agenda, and it was driven by quaff. I'm just going to return to Coincide, again led by Pete Coventry. This was a randomised controlled trial of collaborative care for depression with diabetes and heart disease. And we conducted about 59 interviews with patients with the uh, primary care physicians, with practice nurses, and with psychological well-being practitioners. And if you're in Peter's elevator pitch, you'll, you'll know that we found fairly contrasting results, really, because we demonstrated, using the, the qualitative work, that there was more integration of mental and physical health provision. So practice nurses valued talking to the PWPs. Patients valued the practice nurse and the, the PWP knowing about the depression and the other knowing about the diabetes. Having um, an intervention that was based in primary care reduced stigma, increased access for patients, so we felt we'd achieved integration, this was great. But actually, as this slide demonstrates, this data demonstrates, that there was still division. But PWPs, the psychological wellbeing practitioners, said, well, my area is mental health, her area, the practice nurse area, is, mental, is physical health. No real crossover. That's how we want it. But even more interesting was that patients felt they wanted a separate space between their physical and their mental health care. And I think this is an important result because the agenda is about integration, is about providing holistic care. But patients in our study were all saying, no, we don't buy into this. We want people 
different professionals doing different things and we don't want to talk particularly about our mental health problems in physical health encounters. So I moved to Keele and along with Asula who's on the right um, and then Jim Cox in the middle who's an emeritus professor of psychiatry, we've set up a mental health research group and we've got a mission statement which you can read. Um, now we've got our mission statement, we've got to deliver, we've got to get some funding. And to do that, I want to maintain the collaborations I've got around the UK, and that's all about building bridges. But I think I do a lot of building br bridges in lots of other things I do, and I'm just going to, to go through a few of those now. So, as John said, I work on the NICE guideline groups on multimorbidity and on depression. I think it's really important for us as, as clinical academics to work on these groups, because this is the evidence putting the evidence into practice, and it's what's going to affect commissioning. So I can't, as a GP, <coughs> grumble if a guideline group says one thing when I've not, not contributed. I think the NICE guidelines are um, criticised because they're reductionist. And one thing I would say about the depression guideline is that there is a chapter about qualitative work, and we're going to have the same in the multimorbidity groups, so multimorbidity <coughs> guidelines, so look out for that. So there is a move on the part of NICE to look at non-RCT evidence. And I think Jo said this as well, I'm RCGP, Critical Advisor for Mental Health. But again, as a GP with an interest and expertise in mental health and knowledge of the evidence, it's logical to do that. And we rewrote the curriculum about two years ago, got GMC support for it and approval. Um, and it's a really important thing to support the, the training of our, our, new, our new GPs. And another way of building bridges is working on journals. Um, there's a number of people in the audience who know I habitually press their names and invite them to review. Um, if you want to review and I haven't asked you, please let me know. <laughs> I'm Editor-in-Chief of Health Expectations and I'm going to brag here because we've just increased our um, impact factor to over three, so I'm really pleased about that. Uh, we've also got open access and submissions are welcome. As Helen recognised, patient public engagement, involvement and engagement is really key. Before you think about a research question, is it important to the patient? Let's get patient involvement in um, writing the, the uh, funding application, in writing the ethics application, in developing public facing documents, and then in dissemination. And I can introduce Carol and Adele from the research user group at Keele. Again, a really well established user group. And I think they must have been a bit surprised when I came along and said, Oh, I want something on self harm, or I want a group on um, CFSME, because they'd done a fantastic job in getting a group of users who were experts in musculoskeletal problems. So I want to say thank you to Carol and Adele. And another bridge that we perhaps are not as good as, as we should be is recognising the vital role of the third sector, both as, as clinicians in working with the third sector, and that was something that in Chris's AMP project we attempted to do, but also in research, actually doing research with, with the third sector. And we've just got some funding to work with Age UK, who are co-applicants on the study. Depression Alliance have been fantastic with the RCGP, supporting the work that's done around mental health. And I've discovered the Beth Johnson Foundation, which is a North Staffs group, who do lots of work for older people around mental health. And actually, you know, I think it's a lesson to us that we shouldn't reinvent the wheel. We should look at what's being done out there, but we should offer to evaluate it. It's not going to be commissioned if it's not evaluated. And the last bridging activity is increasing research capacity in academic primary care. And apologies if anybody's photograph has been missed off. I can see two people in the audience who are probably feeling really fed up with me. I'm sorry. So I have always, I think, played a key role in supporting doctors getting onto the steps of academic general practice. And these are the, the clinical academics of the future. And then I've actually replaced the bridge in the top left with some scaffolding because I think 
It's more about supporting and encouraging medical students to get involved in that first step. And this is Bethan and Sophie, who were medical students in my practice and then asked if they could stay with me to do their research options at the University of Manchester a couple of years ago. They devised a qualitative study because they were interested in the concept of touch, how touch was used in consultations. And this idea arose from their observations that perhaps I behaved differently to a previous GP that they'd, they'd sat in with and spent time with. So they interviewed patients and GPs around the use of touch in the consultation. They got a paper published in BJGP. And I think perhaps more importantly for them, their work has influenced communication skills teaching in the Manchester Medical School. So lastly, I thought I'd better talk about work-home balance. And I don't always get it right, but I, I suppose I want to say to those younger people, perhaps don't take a leaf out of my book because I don't get it right. But I try, and I like my holidays. I like sitting in the sun, so again, if you look at the, the blog, then it shows me sitting in the garden. So if there's sunshine, I shall be out with my shades. And at this point, that these are not just two people on the slide, they are people who are relevant to me. So my son, I have to thank for doing this, some of the slides. And my daughter, I'm not, going to thank, I'm not going to talk about her shoes, which I did at my inaugural lecture, but I'm going to say that she's here at SAPSI not just to support me, but also because she's got a poster here. Um, and I'm really <coughs> proud of you. And lastly, I need to thank my husband. Um, Long-suffering. He's good with the garden. He's good with shopping, cooking, organisation, and generally looking oh. after me. Um, and I think without him, I certainly wouldn't be here. And, and the need <coughs> for a partner to support you in an academic career, I think, is... It's pretty vital. Mm -hmm. So, thanks for listening. That's about it. I will take questions, but you might just want to go for a drink instead. <laughs>